Hi, and welcome to our online service. I'm so thankful you were able to make it. Let us open up the service in the name of the triune God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin together. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable to you, O Lord. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God does forgive us our sin. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Jesus Christ, and by Christ's authority, I therefore declare to the penitent the entire forgiveness of their sin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray the prayer of the day together. O King of glory and Lord of countless angels, in triumph you ascended to the highest heaven. Abandon us not to be orphans, but keep your Father's promise to send your Spirit of truth. You live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's continue by singing our opening hymn. Our first scripture lesson comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, reading in Christ's name. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates." Our New Testament lesson is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17, reading in Christ's name. 
But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Here ends our scripture lessons. Praise be to you, O God. Our gospel lesson is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. It is the Great Commission. Jesus is speaking. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Here ends our gospel reading. Praise be to you, O Christ. As we celebrate Ascension Sunday and also Confirmation Sunday at the same time, I think it's appropriate that we do look at the Great Commission. As Jesus has fulfilled all that was needed to provide salvation to any and all who placed their trust in him as Lord, Savior, and Messiah, he was now going to ascend to the right hand of the Father and wait for a time to which he will come and return again. No one knows that time except for God himself, and we wait patiently for his return, and we look forward to that return. But in the meantime, there's a few things that the Lord has entrusted to us. What he has entrusted to us is a message of reconciliation, the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, as it says in the gospel of Luke. And here, in the same sense, Jesus gives the great commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But where do we begin in this wonderful process? Since we are celebrating Confirmation Sunday and celebrating our confirmands and the wonderful work that God has done in their heart, but also praying that God would continue to bring to completion that which he started in those hearts, we look at the discipleship from the sense of children through baptism, confirmation, and also trusting in Christ all the days of their life. And so join me as we take a brief look at the Great Commission in light of confirmation and also teaching our students and our children the Holy Word of God. Pray with me, please. Lord, I thank you for this text and this reminder of the Great Commission. I thank you um, for your wonderful words, and I pray that we would take them seriously. Uh, Lord, help us to keep the Word of God as a central part of our home. And Lord, I do pray that every word that proceeds from my mouth would be from you and not from me. I pray that it's in the power of your Holy Spirit, according to your holy word, and not from myself. Jesus, I pray that you would receive all the glory, honor, and praise. I pray these things in Christ's precious name. And all of God's people said, amen. And so the very first thing we're going to discuss here this morning is that baptism is the beginning to becoming and being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Baptism is the beginning to becoming and being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so the word order is important here. We begin by baptizing and then teaching. Baptism is a wonderful means of grace by which the Holy Spirit places saving faith within the heart and mind of a child through the ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit according to the Holy Word of God. They move from the kingdom of darkness into God's kingdom of light. They are new creations in Christ Jesus. But it is a beginning. It is remarkable. The Apostle Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 6, verse 4. He says, You were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And that newness of life is described in that new creation theology we see all throughout the New Testament we are new creations in Christ Jesus. The old has passed away and the new has come. The condemnation that the law brings with its legal demands, as it says in Colossians chapter 2, has been nailed to the cross. Jesus openly defeated Satan and the power of sin and death in our lives. Hallelujah and amen. But as I said in the, the beginning of this section, baptism is a beginning. My seminary professor asked me this profound question. Do we evangelize the baptized? And the answer is yes, we do. We continue to teach and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ 
uh, to these wonderful children, these beautiful children that God has given us. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Yes, baptism does save, as it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, where it says, baptism which corresponds to this now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. But there is always this already and not yet reality in salvation, even in baptism, in sanctification, and then one day it will come to completion as Christ does return to gather all those children who are his, those who have bowed their knee to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and trusted in his name all the days of their life. He brings them to that new reality. But as we teach our children diligently, as it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we diligently teach the word of God to our children because faith does come by hearing and hearing through the word of God. We must be an agent as parents, guardians, grandparents, and the believing church to aid God in his work in that person's heart because God has knit us together as a congregation. Now, God doesn't need us, especially in the gift of salvation. Salvation is totally, entirely a work of God. But this wonderful gift of growth in Christ Jesus, sanctification, spiritually maturing into the people God has called us to be, the church is a part of that, but it begins in the home. We must teach our children the word of God. We must continually root them in the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. The next thing that we see uh, in our text is that discipleship continues in the home. Discipleship continues in the home. Again, go forth and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And here's where kind of the rubber starts to hit the road. Teaching them to observe all I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you. And so I remember becoming a new dad as my oldest son, Zechariah, was born. There's no manual. (laughs) There's the Holy Word of God, which is wonderful, but there's no uh, step A, step B, and step C. You just kind of figure it out as you go. Uh, But the one thing that I remember very clearly is my pastor, as Zechariah was born, encouraged me that I needed to step into the call that I had on my life. And I, I was like, what call was that? Because at that time, I was an audio engineer, and and I was very happy in my career. And he said, the call to be the spiritual leader of your home. And I was like, what does that look like? I don't know that I had ever heard that before. And unfortunately, I did. I went to church my whole life. I was confirmed in the Lutheran church. But no one really instructed me as, as a man on what it would be to be the spiritual leader of my home. We see this all throughout Scripture. Deuteronomy, our text says, you know, and these words that I command you, you shall... They shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. All through the book of Proverbs, we see that listen to your father's teaching, listen to your mother's teaching, reminding us that the father and the mother are really the primary teachers of the word of God. Because if we think about the tabernacle and the worship in the tabernacle, the tabernacle was primarily used for the forgiveness of sin through the sacrificing of animals. Again, that all pointed forward to what Christ would accomplish. There was no teaching. Every once in a while, there'd be, there would be public reading of scripture, but this was to be done in the home. Proverbs chapter 22, verse six says, train a child in the way that they should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now this wonderful principle, as we continue to teach the word of God, really applied to my life. That even though there was an um, aspect where we did go to church, there was an, also a rebellious aspect in me, that sin nature that rose up. And between the ages of 18 and 24, I did walk away from God and live a sinful life. But God pursued me. These words, the word of God that I learned in confirmation, the word of God that I heard on every Sunday as we went to church continually began to just really poke at my heart and began to call me back to him. And God was faithful and he pursued me. He is the good shepherd that leaves the 99 and goes after the one. And at that time, I was the one who was lost. And at the age of 24, a revival of the faith that was given to me in my baptism took place. And I am so grateful for that. But without that teaching, without being rooted in the word of God, I don't know what would have happened. And I don't even want to guess. I'm just thankful that God did the work that he did. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. As we even look at the fall in the Garden of Eden, as Eve was really the first one to eat the fruit, 
The person charged with the responsibility in the New Testament is Adam. Men were to be the spiritual leaders of our home, teaching our children diligently the word of God, finding tools to do that. I know that I used to read um, Luther's prayers to my children in the evening, and I would also read them Luther's small catechism in the evening. And that's really the reason he wrote it, uh, was to give a tool to parents to teach their children the word of God through three things they had memorized, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments. And so maybe it's time to return to that. But I do pray that each one, under the sound of my voice, who has children and grandchildren, would take this call, whether you're a grandfather or a grandmother, whether you're a mom or a dad, that you would seek to diligently teach your children the Holy Word of God, to teach them and root them in the saving gospel of Jesus Christ, so that they can be that oak planted next to streams of living waters, and in, like it says in Psalm chapter 1, so when the dry season comes, they still bear fruit. That we abide in Christ continually, as it says in John chapter 15. Because Jesus does warn us, as we're going to talk about, those who endure to the end will be saved. And so there's an aspect of walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and doing so in the pursuit of Christ, seeking first the kingdom of God, and that we do it all the days of our life. The final thing that we see in our text is that discipleship is brought to completion through the promise of eternal life. Discipleship is brought to completion through the promise of eternal life in Christ Jesus. As I said before, there's this already and not yet reality in salvation. Those who are in Christ Jesus, you are clothed in Christ's righteousness. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus, and you are saved. The assurance of faith brings this sense of freedom and joy. And we should walk in that freedom and that joy. But as we continue to allow God to prune us, again, as it says in John chapter 15, to mold us, to allow us to continually be transformed, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, as we are transformed from one degree of glory to another, more and more like Jesus and less and less like our sinful nature. We know that this command to teach the Holy Word of God and to learn about the Holy Word of God never ends. The word disciple means learner. We are to be lifelong learners of this wonderful Savior, this wonderful triune God who has saved us through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. That's why it says in verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. But that end of the age is, is the fo- part I want to focus on, because Christ will come again. We confess this in the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed and the Athanasian Creed. He will return to bring those who are his home to live with him for all eternity. I say hallelujah and amen to that reality. This world is not our home, but as we are in our wilderness wandering on our way to the promised land, waiting for Christ to return again, may we be that kingdom of priests that we are called to, as it says in 1 Peter chapter 2. May we continually declare the excellencies of Jesus Christ who has brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And may we do this with and without words all the days of our life. John 15 verses 3 through 5 reminds us of how we need to be dependent upon Christ all the days of our life and grow in that dependence as we wait for him. Beginning in verse 3, Jesus says, Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. We must continually grow in our dependency upon God and the power of the Holy Spirit Because the warning that's given, especially in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, of those who have this gift of faith given to them, like the parable of the talents, the first man buried it into the sand. And as he reported back to the king, the king said, depart from me, you wicked servant. And so there is a warning. There is a responsibility with the faith that we have been entrusted with that we do need to continue and to walk in that saving faith as a part of the good works that God prepared beforehand, as it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, to continually work out our salvation with fear and trembling, to continually embrace a life of confession and repentance toward a salvation without regret, because Christ is worthy. He is worthy of our honor. He is worthy of our praise. 
And I do pray that every single person under the sound of my voice would trust in him all the days of their life. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 10 through 13, Jesus says this, and then many, he's talking about the end times, which seems as though it, it feels like we're in, whether we are or not, I'll leave that up to the Lord. But boy, with the things happening around us, it sure feels like it. But Jesus said this, and then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And we see that in society for sure. Continuing in verse 11, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of lawlessness will increase, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And so for those who trust in Christ Jesus and grow in that wonderful dependency that Jesus describes in John chapter 15, I pray that we would do so. The writer of Hebrews encourages us of the very same thing in chapter 12. We are to look to Jesus as the author and the perfecter of our faith, and that we would do so all the days of our life, that we would understand that there is a responsibility to the saving faith that Christ has entrusted us with, and we will give an account before the Lord as we stand before him, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Baptism is a beginning. Discipleship begins in the home. May we be committed to dil diligently teaching our children the word of God. May we embrace this process joyfully. May Christ be the most important person in our homes. May God's word be precious to us in our homes. May we continually be devoted to the word of God, reading the word of God, and studying the word of God, applying it to our lives in the power of the Holy Spirit, embracing the pruning process, that transformation process that the Father works in us, bringing to completion that which Christ started through the waters of baptism. And may we embrace that process. May we see it as an act of worship, a response of faith motivated by love for what Christ has done for us. May we always see that following Christ is our worship because he is worthy. And may we always see it as an honor and a privilege because Christ has given us the promise of eternal life. And when he returns at the end of the age to not only judge the living and the dead, he will bring those who are his home to live with him for all eternity to a place with no more pain, no more sickness, a place where death is no more. And I say amen to that. It's worth waiting for. It's worth trusting in Christ. It's worth growing in our dependency in him. So may we do just that. May we look to Jesus all the days of our life, placing our trust in him, because scripture says everyone who places their trust in him will not be put to shame. Pray with me, please. Lord, I thank you for this text and this time together. I thank you for your holy word. May we never take the salvation of Christ that's contained in your holy word for granted. May we teach our children diligently as you have asked us to. May we continue to allow Christ to bring to completion that which he started. And more than anything, Lord, I pray that you would encourage us and sustain us through the promise of eternal life. We thank you for this time, and I pray these things in Christ's name. And all of God's people said, amen.
Let us continue our time of worship by confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess these words together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us enter into a time of prayer and intercession. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you so much for the believing church. I pray that you would continue to purify and empower your church to not only preach the gospel of Christ for the salvation of souls, but also to sustain those who have called on your name, who are new creations in Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, I pray for local congregations that you would continue to equip and empower them to do the same, to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus Christ, the one who has brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, I thank you for this congregation. I pray that you would continue to lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit and continue to equip us to preach the gospel of Christ to this community with and without words. And may we do so in a way that honors your holy name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, for those who are suffering this morning, maybe those who have contracted the COVID-19 virus or are battling cancer or any type of illness or disease, Lord, I pray that you would be with them, that your mercy would surround them and envelop them, and that the presence of Christ would dwell richly in their hearts and in their home. Lead them according to your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us close by praying together the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I pray that you would have a blessed day. Please receive the benediction taken from Numbers chapter 6. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth and worship the Lord.